Today I'm working on a Damascus billet. And I thought I'd bring you along because I've got a few questions about forge welding and what kind of forge you need to do forge welding or making Damascus or pattern welded steel. So what I've got here is a, at this point, a 240 layer billet ready to forge weld. I've got four pieces here and each one of them have 60 layers or 60 layers of W's and that is a W's pattern. You can go back and look at some other videos and see how I make that pattern. But right now I want to forge weld this back together, draw it out into a final billet, cut it up, and then I'm going to be making a feather billet out of this stack. Wanted to go over some of the questions I have about that process and forge welding in particular. So right now I've got it tacked together on each end. You can tack it on the sides here or weld it, or you can fully seam weld it here and put it in a forge, whether you fuse it or add metal to it. Once you press this down though, you need to grind that off to make sure you get that material off of there because you will have your filler material when you weld it or just when you're fusing, you cross contaminate with 15 and 20, 1084, et cetera, which is what this billet is made from. So that will show up in your pattern. Same on the end here. Once I get this forge welded I'm, and draw it out, I'm gonna cut enough off of the end where I don't have any contaminates on the end because this pattern that shows up on the end will eventually show up on the side of the blade. And if you have cross contamination or anything like that, it's gonna show up in there. So you wanna make sure you get that out of there. To forge weld it, I'm gonna use some kerosene, soak it in there. That kerosene will create a carbon suit layer in there help get a good forge well, but I also add a little flux. You don't have to, I've done it without. I do it for extra precaution. At this point, I've got 70 bucks just in the steel, not counting grinding and using propane, all that stuff, just in the steel. So I take a little extra precaution. And as you can see, I keep it very clean and I try to prevent any cold shuts. So I didn't add any material or any tacks on the side here. I've got this stuff real flat. I've got it tacked together on each end and I make sure I don't have any overlaps here. If I do, once I forge weld it, I'm gonna make sure and cut that out or grind it off to make sure I don't get cold shuts because I'm gonna be turning it on the side and pressing it. And if you have any kind of big valleys in those, in between those joints, you'll press a cold shut in there and it'll show up in your billet. We don't want that. So I'm gonna put it in the kerosene, get it in the forge, and I'm gonna heat it up. Once it comes to full heat, I'm gonna let it soak a few minutes to make sure it's fully heated. I'm gonna get this thing up to a bright yellow, almost white heat, and I'll know I'm ready to forge weld. And then we can discuss from there, but I'm gonna be doing three forge weld passes on here before I do anything on the side. All right, so I'll leave it in the kerosene about 10 minutes, and then I'm just gonna put a little flux on it. Not a lot, just dust it. The kerosene will allow that flux to stick to it while it's cold. And there's one more thing to mention. When you stack these up and fuse them or tack them, one thing you wanna do is preheat this just a little bit with a torch, or you can, you can ease it in your forge and try to do it that way, wire them up, preheat a little bit, maybe 400 degrees or so, then fuse and tack them up. That way you don't have a problem with these things expanding and you're breaking your tacks. That's usually the cause of that. You get so much expansion and your fused metal here will break loose. Thick materials need preheating or they expand tremendously when you heat them up. So preheat them before you weld them a little bit to reduce that expansion.
So I've got the bar to the thickness I want. I've drawn it out and cleaned all the scale off. I've also etched the end of the bar to make sure I've got a good clean end here because this is gonna be the very end of the knife. When this stack is put together, split and drawn out, this end will be on the end of the knife. But I always cut and check, and this is what I wanna show you. You notice there are some bright spots where I've etched it. That has to come out of there. That's cross contamination from when I tigged ends, either got some uh, filler material in there or cross contamination. That's very bright. It looks like 15 in 20 that just blended in. So I'm just gonna keep grinding and testing it till that's all gone. Then I will have my final billet. This end here doesn't matter to me so much because it's gonna be a tang. It'll be hidden. So, I mean, I know it's good to hear, but this doesn't really matter to me. So I get it cleaned up, get it test etched, and uh, we'll go from there. So I've cleaned up the bar till I could see no contamination, any kind of weld inclusion, and I got a good clean etch there. And I can see the pattern. There's 240 layers of W's there. Then I went ahead and cut it up, and I'll have six pieces, and I've cleaned each surface, and they're flat. I use a disc sander to do that, and then I clean them with some brake cleaner to make sure I don't have any ceramic sand or anything like that from the grinding belts. I like to be very clean, make sure I get a good forge weld here. Then I'll stack them up and we'll be ready to forge weld them. So after I get them good and straight here, I'll clamp them together and I'm gonna TIG each side. Now also, when I stack these up, I rotate each pattern. So this is the initial cut, say for this first one, and I just flip it like this. That way, this cut matches that cut. Then the next one stacks right on top of it, flip the next one, and so on. That way my patterns somewhat match up. Don't matter a whole lot about alignment on a feather, but if you're doing a mosaic, you need to take your time. I'll even etch the ends of every piece. And of course, I'll be actually doing a 45 tile flip with those, not a uh, stacked butt well type that this feather is gonna be. You do it this way, so you can stack it up and hot split it and drag them layers down and uh, and then lay it horizontal and draw it out. So what I'm gonna do now is go ahead and tack these up on the sides, not on the, the fronts where the pattern's gonna be and where the, it'll show up on the blade. I will fuse them and forge weld them together, hot split them, and uh, I'll clean up those insides, flatten them a little bit with the press and then tack them back together and we'll pick up from there. All right, while the billet is soaking in kerosene, figured I'd go over some of the questions I've had about the forges and forge welding in a single burner Venturi forge. If you don't know what a Venturi burner is, it's basically a burner that's gas pushing through and pulling air from the top. I've got a little choke up here I can adjust. I run it wide open, it works just fine. But what it comes down to is how well your forge is insulated and how well you can maintain your heat and, and have a higher temperature. This one here is lined K-wool and then a poured refractory in here. It's an old forge. My father built it for me over 25 years ago. It's been modified a couple times and relined several times. And this is the last modification I've done to it where I put a door here and a back door where I could open it up, pick up this arm, push this, open it up, stick my billet all the way through. But with this poured refractory, I don't have any issues with flux eating up. And I do all of my flux welding in this forge. Also run a reduced flame when I'm forge welding. We call it dragon's breath. So running a reducing flame means I've got less oxygen, which is our enemy when forge welding. This forge, one I made recently, and I'll leave a, a video down in the uh, description, a link to it. It's a Don Fogg style forge. And this one basically designed like Master Smith J.W. Randall's forge. This one's a little bigger chamber, but it's a 
forced air. So I have a variable speed blower on here. I can adjust my temperature, but I like to draw out billets with this forge. I get good even heat in here. Here you can have a hot spot with a single burner, but I can put a bigger billet. I've got the same thing, an open door here that I can open up and stick the billet through and get the forging done, draw it out done. This is the same way, have K wool on the outside with a poured castable in here. Like I said, key to having good heat, high temps for doing forge welding and uh, having a good performing forge is insulation. But if you got any questions, just leave them down in the comments. I thought that would help some of the uh, questions I've had about them. So if somebody tells you you can't forge weld with a single burner venturi, well, it's probably because they don't have a well insulated forge. So let's get the billet in here and forge weld it. So what you saw me do right there at the end was I took the two halves. First, I cut them off of the handle and split them, make sure they were split, and then put them back in the forge and flatten them out a little bit because I want the mating surfaces to be flat. Then I take it over to the belt grinder and clean them up all the way around and then over to the disc sander and flatten them. And then I inspect the two halves to make sure there's not any cracks or any D lambs or anything in there because when you hot split them, that's gonna put a tremendous amount of stress on that billet. And that's where you're gonna find out if you got a good forge weld or not. Now, when these get drawn out, you're gonna be putting a lot of stress on them as well. So I've got them flat. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put them together and I'm gonna weld the ends, not the sides. I'm not gonna introduce anything on the sides. This is where the pattern is gonna be. It'll draw out from here. Then I'll put a handle on it and I'll go back over to the grinder and I will make sure these seams are perfectly matching on both sides. I don't want any chances of a cold shut or anything like that. That's what causes a lot of problems like that is you need to be clean and make sure you take care and look at your billets and you don't have any issues going on. If I've got any edge D lamb or anything like that, I'm gonna grind all that off, grind it down until everything is clean no issues. And when you're using this cutter, I forge it down and I've got about a 3 16 landing. It's a convex landing there. It quickly branches out to a 3 16 right here. Before I had a press, the first few feathers I did, I did with a hatchet like this. And I'd use the hole fast and held my part down and hammered through it. Those were not high layer count billets. Uh, to do a 240 layer billet by hand, by the time I got to here, there would be nothing left hardly because of loss of scale in and out of the forge. That's why doing mosaics, you really need something efficient like a press or a power hammer. And these look very good. No uh, D lambs or nothing like that. So I'm gonna go ahead, put them together, put the handle on them and put it back in the forge.
Okay, I got the billet forged out to about a quarter inch, still in rough form. I did slightly forge in the tip. I won't do any more forging on the blade except for forging in the ricasso and drawing out the tang. I don't like to do much forging the shape on a mosaic or a feather because it distorts it too bad. There will be some distortion on the point, but that just kind of help it flow toward the point a little bit. But at this point, I like to go ahead and grind all the scale off and take a look to make sure I don't have any problems, any cracks or any tears. Sometimes you'll get tears along the edge here if you forge it too cold and too hard. So as the thinner you get, it cools quicker. So you gotta be very careful, especially with a mosaic or a feather blade. You really test out your forge welds when you do this, which is why I wanted to bring you along for this project. So I had 240 layers that I cut up and stacked six tall, which makes that about 1,450 layers technically. So a lot of stress, a lot of layers, high chances for having problems. So if you did bad forge wells, it'll show up. After I take a look at everything, make sure it's good, I'm gonna do a test etch. Now I've got it up to around 400 grit. I normally don't take it up that high for a test etch, but I want you to be able to see the pattern. And also the reason I test etch is that I can now see how my pattern's flowing, where the center is, and how to proceed next to forge in my ricasso. And I forge in that ricasso so I can push the stem or the center of the feather up in through the middle of the ricasso. I just think it looks cool. So I'm gonna do a test etch and then we'll take a look at the pattern. Okay, with our etching done, now I can see where the center of the feather is and I can go ahead and figure out where to push in my ricasso and forge out the tang. This is gonna be a feather buoy. And so I've got enough room here to forge it in and draw it out. But like I said, I'm not gonna forge in this tip anymore. It's already distorted enough. I know it's hard to see the pattern here. So I'll give you some better shots here. And before we do that, I wanted to mention that please keep the families and all that maybe you have some relatives and everyone in your thoughts and prayers for the victims of Hurricane Helene from the Florida coast all the way up into North Carolina, where a lot of cities are just devastated. And one of them being our good friend, John Norwood, lost his house, his shop, and he still haven't found his fiance as of this recording. So please keep them in your thoughts and prayers. So if you got any questions, please leave them down in the comments. But I'd like to thank my patrons, and I want to thank you for watching. But if you'd like to see me finish this build, let me know down in the comments. Now here's a look at the 400 grit etch on this rough billet. Mm -hmm.